scripture reading is from Romans 5.15. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? This is the word of God. June are celebration months. Between graduation ceremonies and bridal showers and weddings and new grandbabies, there are a lot of picture-taking opportunities. Now, even if you don't have anyone who's finishing school or getting married, it's possible that somebody has opened up a picture album for you to admire how much little Johnny looks like Uncle Fred or how that crooked nose might be more of a family trait than you first thought. But besides physical similarities in families, there are common behaviors, likes and dislikes, and all manner of particularities that distinguish one branch of the family tree from another. Perhaps the same is true with the family of faith. There are certain traits or characteristics that identify us as being part of the larger family of God. Now, Paul boldly claims that we are justified by faith through grace. In a nutshell, this means that we are made right with God because of Jesus' actions on our behalf and our acknowledgement and acceptance of that. We cannot, in any manner, earn eternal salvation. It is a gift. But Paul just as boldly declares that there are a definitive set of values, virtues, if you will, that a true disciple should purposefully cultivate and visibly demonstrate. And he is saying that we need to both talk the talk and walk the walk of faith. The challenge for the church through the centuries, and one of the reasons that there are so many different denominations, is that there is a tension between Paul's two statements. Believers have at times been a bit uncertain about where to focus their energy. Do I put most of my energy on my faith? Do I put most of my energy on my action? Where do I draw the line? Is there some kind of proof positive that verifies our faith. Theologian named Robert Masson suggests that we need to approach the question not as an either or, but as a Christian circle of faith whose center is Christ. If we put Christ in the middle, if we put Christ at the center, and we orbit around that, then we are going to touch all of the places we need to touch. Our conversion, the acceptance of God's love and acceptance of us, must involve our heads, our hands, our heart, and our feet. Paul called for this same totality of involvement when he spoke of the need to cultivate character by means of suffering, endurance, and hope that does not disappoint. Now, all of these qualities and each part of the body can work together for faithfulness. Issues involving justice, morality, or even common sense stretch our minds and test the metal of our character. In other words, when you're thinking about whether or not something is right, when you're thinking about it, when somebody poses a question to you and says, what is the ethical, right, moral thing to do, then it's our mind that gets stretched in some way. It's informed by our faith. It's informed by our understanding of Scripture but still, it's our mind that's being stretched. I don't remember who first said it, but character is defined by how we act when no one is looking. In other words, um, how we behave as long as somebody's looking at us doesn't matter nearly as much as how we behave when somebody isn't looking at us. 
Questions that pierce our hearts penetrate to the very roots of our reasons for hopefulness. There are some questions that have no answers here on earth. Now there's healing, but maybe no answers. And we choose whether to toss out our beliefs or to hold fast to God's promise that nothing can separate us from his love. And then putting our hands to work in service for our faith entails suffering. I'm going to say that one more time because it is so true. Putting our hands to work in service to our faith entails suffering. Whenever we have the opportunity to do something for somebody else, we discover sometimes just how broken we are, not them. We discover how broken we are. Placing one stubborn foot in front of the other, continuing on despite obstacles and opinions, takes endurance. What we are talking about here are the classical virtues, hope and temperance, also known as patience, justice, wisdom, courage, and truth. My friends, you can't, you can't watch the news. You can't read a newspaper. You can't listen to the radio. You just barely can have conversations with others in which these things are not tested. People have opinions. People have ideas about what is right and what is wrong. People have ideas about what should and should not happen to others. We have an opportunity always for our character to be built. We know this is true. The question is, what does it look like? How do we do it? First grade teacher was having an unusually difficult day. Any teachers among us? <laughs> it had rained all day. The kids couldn't go outside to play, and as the day wore on, the kids got more and more restless. The teacher could hardly wait for the bell to ring to indicate that the school day was finally over. It was still raining at 2.45, so she decided to get the kids ready for dismissal. She sorted out all of their boots and raincoats and started helping them get them on. And finally, they were all ready to go with the exception of one little boy whose boots were just too small for his feet. There were no zippers or Velcro tabs on his boots. It took every last ounce of strength she had to get those boots on that boy's feet. And when at last she had them on, she straightened up with a sigh. The little boy looked down at his feet for a moment, and then he said, Teacher, you know what? These boots aren't mine. <laughs> well, she didn't know whether to laugh or to cry, but being the good person that she was, she smiled bravely, and she started to take them off. And let me just say that they didn't come off any easier than they went on. She yanked and she tugged until finally she got them off. And at that point, the boy smiled and said, They ain't my boots, but they're my sister's and I've got to wear them. <laughs> now, I'm not sure if this particular character-building sequence of events is what Paul was preaching about, but it does sound like the definition of patience to me. According to the dictionary, patience is the will or the ability to wait or endure without complaint, steadiness, endurance, or perseverance in the performance of a task. Some of the synonyms of patience are forbearance and long-suffering. The definition of forbearance is restraint under provocation, refraining from retaliation for a wrong. Paul uses the word suffering in his list of attributes that contribute to the building of one's character. And what I think he means by suffering in this context is forbearance or long-suffering. It implies being patient with a situation or a person that is not likely to change or get better. The dictionary definition of long-suffering is to bear injuries, insults, or troubles patiently over a long duration of time. We live 
in a culture that wants immediate gratification. We live in a culture that says if it's a difficult situation, if something is paining us, if somebody is difficult, then you just throw them away or you find some kind of medicine to fix it immediately or you just ignore the situation and hope that it goes away. Life doesn't work like that. Sometimes we're married to the person who is difficult. Sometimes it's our child or another family member. Sometimes there is a situation that is so broken we have no idea how we can ever fix it. All we know is that we are required by God to live with it in such a way that brings glory to God. I'm not in anybody's pocket and I wasn't in anybody's home this week, okay? <laughs> I'm just telling you how life is. And so we look to scripture sometimes to give us clues, to give us direction, to give us hope for how it is that we can live with a particular situation or a particular person. How is it that we are transformed into the likeness of Christ? Forbearance leads to endurance or fortitude or what some people call Christian courage. Paul was committed to preaching the good news regardless of his circumstances. His was courage and perseverance of the highest degree. Rather than seeking revenge against those who ridiculed him or put him in jail, he held on to his hope of the approaching glory of God and kept preaching to those who would listen. He exhibited Christian endurance, demonstrating his faithfulness even when things weren't going his way. I heard this story several years ago. It stuck with me because it brought me up short on my own behavior toward others. In other words, it was one of those ouch moments where I really got it. The pastor sat down at a counter stool at a diner and was waiting to be served, to be noticed. The wait staff had walked by several times. The cooks and the busboy hadn't paid him any attention. His ego was soothed only because the truck driver seated next to him was being ignored as well. Well, maybe this counter is off limits, the pastor said to the truck driver. And the trucker responded, maybe they're short of help. Maybe they don't want our business, the pastor retorted. Maybe they're taking care of those seated at the tables, came the soft reply. The hands on the clock continued to move. Maybe they don't like us, the pastor said in a huff. The air conditioning feels so good, I don't mind waiting, the trucker said. And at this point, a harried waitress stopped to tell them, that the water had been cut off and the dishwasher wasn't functioning. The trucker smiled at the, the preacher, thanked the waitress, and left. In telling the story on himself, the pastor said, I didn't like that trucker much. <laughs> Three times I sought his support for my obnoxious attitude, and he let me down every time. <laughs> Only later did I realize that he had chosen to practice what I preach. A Christian can use the right words all day long, but do we have a recognizably Christian character? There are plenty of unique characters both inside and outside the church. The goal that Paul is aiming for is the melding together, the integration of hope, suffering, endurance, and character into a consistently faithful, spirit-filled whole. The family resemblance to Christ comes when a person's behavior, actions, and character conform to that of Christ. So when you're tempted to complain, tempted to argue, tempted to find fault, tempted to get even. I think the question is, 
What kind of character do we want to exhibit? And, and who do we think is watching? There's probably at least one person in everyone's family that nobody wants to resemble. But in the family of faith, we all want to bear a resemblance to Jesus Christ so that when others see us, they can tell we are related to him on our Heavenly Father's side. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.